Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Design, and we're here at the Virtual Design Festival with Fritz Hansen to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of the great Italian designer Vico Magistretti. Magistretti designed a chair, the Vico Duo, for Fritz Hansen, and to discuss the legacy of the designer and the chair itself, which is being reissued this year, we have Christian Anderson, who's head of design at Fritz Hansen. Hi, Christian. Hello. Tell us a little bit about where you are, first of all, Christian, where are you yeah, sitting? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sitting at our headquarters, uh, at Fritz Hansen's headquarters in Allerød, uh, which is a city north of uh, Copenhagen, uh, where Fritz Hansen has been for the last 120 odd years. Uh, so, uh, so I'm sitting at the factory. Are you the only person there or is the factory? No, I'm not the only one here. Uh, we, we've, uh, we are following the rules to the max here. It's very hard to drive a design company and, and, and be close to our all our things up here if uh, on a distance so uh, we are on this road shift thing but but uh, a, a few people from each department and so the machine is still running up here tell us a little bit about yourself then what do you do at fritz hansen and what is your background my title here is head of design uh, and uh, i am the proud owner of the uh, fritz hansen collection and the uh, sort of roadmap and pipeline of products that we develop up here uh, both in uh, furniture, in light, and in accessories. Tell us a little bit about Fritz Hansen then, if you could tell us the history of the company and uh, the kind of products that it produces and the whole ethos of the brand. Yeah, Fritz Hansen is, um, was founded in 1872 uh, by Fritz Hansen himself as a carpentry and, and a sort of parts making company for other furniture brands in the center of Copenhagen. Um, quickly evolved into becoming an own brand with own products. Uh, and in the, uh, in the kind of the beginning of the 10th, uh, just after the, uh, the, the century uh, shift, we moved up here to Elrod uh, because of logistics and because of uh, the forest that we are sitting in the middle of, which was our natural resource for the many years in the beginning of Fortensen's history when it was all about uh, solid wooden furniture. Um, until a few years ago, a family-owned company, um, now owned by a foundation, a charity foundation. Uh, but, uh, but mainly our focus has been on producing sort of high quality uh, crafted uh, furniture uh, and in the later years also light and accessories. We started off, or for Tenson started off, um, working with uh, kind of non-designed products designed by the manufacturer ourselves. But already in the uh, late 1930s, uh, uh, Fritz started collaborating with architects and designers and became what I consider today a design-driven and design-passionate company. We consolidated ourselves, so to speak, in the beginning of the 50s and probably developed our design DNA um, together with, uh, with Arne Jacobsen and Paul Kerholm and Wegner and the others who designed furniture uh, products for us uh, from the late 1940s and forward. That has been driving the company ever since. You said that the company moved to be closer to the forest where the wood yeah. comes from, in fact, yeah. into the middle of the forest. And when yeah. you were setting up your laptop at the beginning of this talk, you showed me out the window and you literally are in a forest, right? Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. It is, uh, we, the, the spot up here was chosen as, as, you know, the site for the lumber mill that would uh, supply for Tenson in the city with, uh, with materials. But quickly, uh, there's always a son in a company like this that wants to revolutionize his father's business. And, and so was it for, for Tenson as well. The, the son, Christian Hansen, was the one industrializing for Tenson and, and seeing the opportunities in working with, uh, with both an industrial way of producing, but also working with architects and designers. And, and, um, and it is literally in the middle of the forest. We, we long ago gave away the forest to the city of, of where we are for, for, for them to, uh, to have. And, and all of the surroundings here around us, the, uh, the vast uh, production facility, which the lumber mill is, is, is far gone, uh, has been giving to uh, the Boy Scouts and the uh, walking club and the uh, whatever. So there's a lot of uh, people just around us. We sit in the middle of a... a, a um, a um, inhabited uh, full of villas and, and, and stuff. So, so it is quite a unique uh, location. So it's good to know that the forest is still there. You didn't chop yes. all the trees No, there. no, no. <laughs> no. I think very shortly after he realized that the forest was by far not big enough for his venture. So, uh, so luckily it's still there. And you mentioned some of the great Danish and Scandinavian designers that Fritz Hansen hmm. worked with in the early days. 
but, but clearly you worked with other designers as well, including Duca Magistretti. So talk yep. about the, the designers that you've worked with over the mm. years and mm. um, the Scandinavian ones and the non-Scandinavian ones as well. It probably started all the way back in the 30s uh, when, uh, when old kind of and famed Danish designer Kåre Klit came to Fortansen with, uh, with a chair for a church um, out in uh, out in Bellahoy, uh, outside Copenhagen, uh, which is now a very famed and and uh, and listed uh, building, uh, and, and I think the curiosity of Fortensen's son uh, Christian um, collaborating with these kind of creative minds and seeing both a uh, an opportunity for for his company, but also an opportunity for uh, for let's say developing a a Fritzensen style. Uh, started already there. Uh, quickly, it became uh, uh, Hans Wegner in the years around the Second World War. But but it was kind of the arrival of Arne Jacobsen in in 1949, sort of 1949-1950, where he was commissioned uh, to do a headquarter for a Danish pharmaceutical company, and he made the ant chair. He was very much inspired by uh, the the Rogers and the uh, Sinens and whoever the Eameses who uh, who worked with uh, modern materials and 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 his plywood one one piece plywood chair that that then became the end uh, was the beginning of of sort of probably the more well known for Tenten brand. Um, quickly, uh, a lot of other designers came in. Uh, many of the um, of the designers of the time of the fifties and sixties died young. They died in the late 60s, early 70s. So quickly it became uh, Werner Penton and other uh, uh, Danish and Scandinavian designers. And, um, and then Fritz Hansen ventured into a period of, of a lot of focus on the contract market, uh, bringing in designers, both Danish designers, but also international designers like Vigo Magistrati and Burkhard Fogtherr and others. Pierre Lissoni uh, came in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Danish designers like Casper Salto and Cecilia Mans. Um, and lately here, within the last 10-15 years, it's been uh, much about Jaime Hayon and uh, Nendo and others who are working or that I am working with now on our current collection. So it has been a, a slow move towards a more international uh, design community around us and also uh, a, let's say, a need for a for Tansen to have a global outlook on uh, on what we do and, and thereby also encompassing uh, you know foreign uh, or non Danish designers and it has brought us a lot it has brought us a lot of knowledge about the world and the market and it's brought us a lot of of, uh, of good uh, uh, discussions and and good uh, design projects uh, over the last let's say twenty five years and how do you ensure when you're working with a designer like Jaime Hayon or or Nendo, or indeed Vico Magistretti, how do you ensure that the product that they create with Fritz Hansen retains something of the Fritz Hansen DNA and doesn't look like uh, a collaboration that those designers could have done with a, another brand? What is unique about Fritz Hansen's approach, its materiality, its, its um, design ethos, do you think? I think that, first of all, I'm the proud believer in that designers do not work for us, they work with us. And we have a very strong design team here consisting of of designers and architects who, uh, who, you know, it's almost impossible to get them away from the pen and the paper and into a project management or whatever they do. But, uh, but we spend a lot of time discussing with the designers and we, we take big pride in sharing everything that we know in Fortensen uh, to our designers and so to speak, to teach them or, or, or enlighten them in all our, uh, you know, aspects of how our company works. Most, Importantly, I try to share a lot with them in the beginning when we either scope a project for a designer or we ask a designer for a specific uh, uh, job that they understand our design DNA and they understand our, our way of, 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 of operating. And mainly our design philosophy consists of three simple words. It's, it's about functionality, it's about rationality, and it's about emotions. And the last one is the most important one for me. All the discussions about how uh, products operate and how they, how they work and ergonomics and, and productability and all that, that's for, uh, for our project to ensure. But I spend a lot of time on the emotional part of what we do. We have discussions about the uh, serenity and truth and Danish and other words that we use to kind of measure if the design lives up to our expectations. And, some years ago, we tried to 
do an exercise where we describe some of our sort of heritage and classic products. And those words, we would try to see when we did a design project, if the new product lived up to those kind of words and, and those uh, kind of sentences. And it was an interesting exercise because uh, how, do you, how do you end the discussion about serene or pure or true or aids with beauty or whatever some of the words that we use. It is much about material and we are much about a unique sort of idiom and, and, and shape in our products. They are sculptural, most of them. And it's been driven or been driving the the Fertensen uh, design DNA ever since Arne Jacobsen, I think. So, so asking a designer like Chaim Hayon might be, um, you know, um, another way of, or a, a uh, sort of a weird combination. But but Chaim is a unique sculptor. He's a ceramist. He 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 works with shape and form. He understands proportions, and it just took a little while to get him into uh, the uh, sort of the uh, the toolbox of furniture and and he was able to interpret our kind of sculptural design feel into the products that he made for us in the uh, in the zeros and the tens let's talk about Vico Magistretti then yeah first of all could you tell us who Vico Magistretti was why was he so important maybe he was one of the great Italian designers from the 20th yeah. century wasn't he yeah, he was born in in in, in 1920 uh, in an architect family of both father and and grandfather being architects. Um, uh, studied at the Polytechnica in, in in Milan and 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 is considered in my book at least uh, among the three uh, big uh, design architects of Italy. If you put the credentials on them, that they needed both to be good architects but also good furniture designers. So, 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 uh, Bagistrati and 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 Castiglioni and and uh, Giuponti were probably the three that were most successful in 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 switching between architecture, furniture, and interior uh, uh, with success. You know, good proportions, simple geometry, very few but good materials, and a good understanding of the company that he worked for. He, he was a good collaborator. And there are many stories about Magistrati's sort of appearance and his uh, his stay here. He loved being here, also because of the scenery here. Uh, that he um, he came here in the in very late part of his life. Uh, his first project for Fortanston was done in 1994, uh, so he would have been 74 years old. Uh, so he would have been the the Nestor or the uh, the, the senior uh, when he came here. Uh, worked with us for those six, seven years uh, up until the beginning of 2001 uh, and, and sadly died in, in 2006. But, but he, he, he could ooze from all his knowledge uh, to us uh, with the projects that he did for us. Very hard tasks that we gave him uh, at that time. So he is, a, uh, in my opinion, one of the, uh, one of the true Italian uh, functionalistic or and, and, and sort of uh, industrial designers uh, that had a great take on, on, uh, on us uh, when, when he worked for us. Did you meet him personally? No, never. I heard so many stories and I'm envious about all the stories that I heard. Um, we have a lot of pictures in our archives of him sitting on chairs and drawing on the floor. He, was, he had, a, he had a, a hard time walking when he was uh, old. Uh, so he sat on a chair and he always wanted to sit on a special chair and then he put the paper on the ground or on the floor and then he had a long sharp pencil and then he drew one to one on the floor sitting in a chair from uh, like nine ish till around 11 then he had a lunch and then he had a nap at the office at a uh, paul Kerholm day bed here he had a nap at the office for an hour and then he came back and started drawing again so it was almost like he lived here when he did the projects and 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 those stories are just so uh, you know amazing that that you really wanted to be there are there any other stories that are part of the fritz hansen <laughs> legend now about magistretti what what was he like as a person how did he he did was he, um, <clears throat> he was considered i think that, at least from the stories that i heard from our ceo who was here at the same time as him, um, that, that, um, that he was a very kind of mellow and, and, and uh, he had this little smile on his lip all the time. I think he really enjoyed that the task that was given to him was hard. You know, he, he was to do the chair that should, uh, you know, come up to the same height as the Sevener chair or the Arne Jacobsen chair. With, with the project was deliberately made so that it was if the world suddenly does not like the Arne Jacobsen furniture anymore, 
David Vigo chair should be the uh, solution. So I think he was uh, confident, but also uh, proud that he uh, that we gave him that task. And how um, did the collaboration with Magistretti come about in the first place? How did Fritz Hansen get in touch with him? Was there already a relationship? And, and you talked about um, the the, brief. My uh, predecessor or the predecessor before him, um, Björn Steger, was a big uh, fan of Magistretti and a big fan of Italy and always wanted uh, to see if it was possible for for Fritz Hansen to uh, to have a uh, to have a collaboration with an Italian designer understanding the uh, sort of the, the period of the late 80s beginning of the 90s where a lot of things happened in Italy and a lot of things happened in Italian design uh, which suited Fritz Hansen's sort of quest for for the more functional and maybe the more uh, sort of uh, contracty uh, uh, furniture pieces and, and it was simply a meeting in Milan, um, where at a, I think it was in, in a part of, of a Salone deal down there that they met up and, and invited uh, him up here for a talk. And, and the project started and, 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 and the first project he did for us came in 1994 and, and was just called the Vico chair, a, a four piece plywood chair with a steel frame. And then in '97, uh, he was contacted again, and that's when the Vigo Duo chair was uh, was designed. And then he did another project in 1999 called Vigo. We always called them Vigo. It was called Vigo Solo, but the Vigo chair and the Vigo Duo chair were by far the most uh, um, successful. Uh, at a certain point, when the Vigo Duo chair was produced, uh, we produced 70,000 of them a year. So quite impressive. So tell us more about the Vico Duo chair then. What is it? Yeah, and, and it is, um, he got the assignment in, in, uh, in 97, 96 and was asked to, uh, to try to do a one piece plywood chair, like the Seven and the Grand Prix and the end chair. And, and he, um, he came about with the idea that he was, uh, was going to change the kind of dynamic of how the chair looked. Typically Italian 90s style, it should move a little, it should have a little speed in its kind of design language and, and be a little bit more kind of uh, soft in its, its curve, but then uh, stick to a much simpler uh, squarish form on the seat. A very quick project, done very quickly because he tapped into a vocabulary and a production method that was so close to our core that, that the project was actually done fairly quickly and introduced in market fairly quickly with quite some success. So it's been in our archive uh, all along, all the way since 1994. Simple uh, would be my best word. Uh, extremely comfortable because he challenged the thickness of the chair. Uh, we make uh, chairs that are kind of eight, nine millimeters thick. And he, uh, he wanted a thinner chair so you were able to kind of flex in the chair when you sat in it. And that is what the comfort is in the plywood chair. And it's a hundred years since Magistretti was born. And uh, to celebrate that, you're reissuing the... Yes, the we are. Here in 2020, it, it is uh, his 100 year. Uh, he was born on the 6th of October, 1920. And we are celebrating him uh, together with the Magistretti family by reissuing the Vigudu chair. We've done some uh, together with the Fondazione and together with Margarita, his uh, granddaughter, a few alterations of the chair bringing it up to 2020 standards. So, you know, people grow in height and the chair had to grow two centimeters and, and all of those standard things that, that happens with, with all designs that need to be reissued. Uh, we changed a little bit of the comfort of the chair and we did some tweaks to the armrest and stuff. But other than that, it is very true to his original design. And we are reissuing it here in, in, uh, in 2020 in, uh, in two versions, a, a non-arm and an arm version. The non-arm version never saw uh, the light of day. I only had one prototype in the basement in a white cardboard box from, uh, from the Vigo days. Uh, so, uh, so it was also uh, time to, uh, to get that out of the cardboard box and see if that could fly. So, uh, so we're actually doing both to, uh, to, uh, to do the celebration. And that version was actually designed by Magistretti himself, but just yes, never yes, produced. Yeah. Yeah, he moved the back legs and chopped off the armrest and stuff. It was very kind of uh, simple, but, but, uh, but it works. And it's, it's a cute stacking, uh, stacking chair. And in terms of the launch, how, how will that happen? Is this the launch or is there going to be... No, yeah, the launch events? was done because of all this, what's going on right now. Uh, the launch was supposed to be uh, now here. We would have shown it at Salone in Milan at our showroom. And, and, and we uh, then decided when... 
Barcelona was postponed and and everything, we uh, we decided to uh, to do a, uh, a launch of it uh, straight into market uh, through the marketing channels, and we see uh, great interest. And we hope that whenever the world is back to uh, some kind of traffic in in our world, we will uh, we will do some uh, some events and some stuff. Probably still do an event in Italy if we can uh, if we can make that work uh, later on in the year. Um, the Magistrati family had made a great effort in in uh, in in preparing the 100 year at the Salona this year. So it's a bit of a shame that that uh, it didn't happen. Well, we'll do our best to, to celebrate <laughs> Vico's centenary yeah. online yeah. as best we can. Um, yeah. Best of luck with the launch. Thanks so much for Thank sharing you. it with us. And um, I think I could do with a flexible chair myself because yes. <laughs> getting a little bit stiff here yeah. in, our, in our video studio, aka our spare bedroom. At our <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Christian, for sharing Thank this you. with us. Thank you.